Good evening. I acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship on the lands on which we meet today. I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. I would also like to acknowledge Senator David Van, Mr. Ted O'Brien, Shadow Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Professor Deborah Terry, AO, Vice Chancellor and President, Professor Robin Batterham, Chair of the Net Zero Australia Project, the Net Zero Australia Project team, sponsors, donors, and collaborators. Welcome to the Net Zero Australia final findings launch. My name is Simon Smart, and I'm the UQ lead for the Net Zero Australia Project. Thank you for joining us this evening, and thank you to those who are joining us online from around the nation and indeed the world. I am pleased at this point to invite Professor Deborah Terry, Vice Chancellor and President of UQ, to the stage to say a few words. Thank you very much, Simon, and welcome everyone, both here in the room and online, to tonight's much anticipated and historic event. Can I begin, obviously, by acknowledging the Net Zero Australia project team and sponsors, donors and partners. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting here tonight. We honour their elders and their continuing cultural and spiritual connection to this land as we walk together on the path to reconciliation. And that same spirit of walking together into a shared future is what brings us all here this evening. Tonight, the Net Zero Australia collaboration between the University of Queensland, UQ, the University of Melbourne, Princeton University, and the NAUS Group releases its findings. Australia has committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2050. We know that's our destination. The challenge has been how we get from here to there. Tonight, that journey will be clearer. So for anyone who has despaired about our climate future, these findings are very helpful. The report shows us what a net zero emissions future could look like for Australia. And from a positive perspective, the report indicates that we already have the knowledge, leadership and technologies we need to achieve net zero by 2050. In sum, after tonight, we will know what we must do to move forward as rapidly as possible. There are still, of course, many challenges and one of them will be mobilising Australia in ways we've never seen before, so that no part of this country is left behind. There's a lot of detail to digest, as you'll hear. The modelling is complex, but the imperatives for the future are clear. We need to remain focused. We need to be coordinated. And above all, we need to collaborate. At UQ, our journey to net zero emissions started around a decade ago. By 2020, when we turned on our 64 megawatt solar farm at Warwick, we became the first university in the world to have the capacity to offset 100% offset of our daytime electricity consumption. And I'm very pleased to say that this will be dwarfed by the schemes that Net Zero Australia envisages of solar farms stretching across Australia's sunbelt, exporting electricity and potentially creating hundreds of thousands of jobs. What stands out to me from reading this report is the need for options. The future is never certain, but the power of this project lies in how the scenarios show not only what Australia must do, but, they also, the, but the project also highlights what we must decide on in relation to our journey to net zero by 2050. As you all know, in 2032, Brisbane will host the world's first climate positive Olympic and Paralympic Games. As a nation, we're also committed to reducing our carbon emissions by 43% by 2030. 
below 2005 levels by 2030. That means the nation has less than a decade to make some really big changes, to showcase to the world at the 2032 Brisbane Olympics and Paralympics how seriously we are taking our commitments to a net zero future. Net Zero Australia is the only national project conceived and now articulated that analyses, analyses in unprecedented detail what it will take for Australia to decarbonise its economy and exports. It gives governments, industry and communities the information they need to both initiate and mobilise change at the pace required by the Paris Agreement. For me, this project is a great example of the collaborative role that universities must play as we collectively seek solutions to the great challenges facing humanity. Net Zero Australia was born out of a spirit of collaboration at UQ's Dow Centre for Sustainable Engineering Innovation. It drew on our deep history of collaborating across borders and our capability to marshal teams of experts across a broad range of disciplines and perspectives. To get to this point, Net Zero Australia has relied on scientists and engineers working with economists and ecologists and experts in many other fields. In fact, Net Zero Australia goes to the very core of the reason that universities exist, to deliver for the public good through our education, our research, in collaboration with industry, with government and with communities. What better expression of our missions than to use this power of collaboration to put the climate genie back in its bottle and protect our shared future. By using the networks and the experts we have and our deep commitment to genuine collaboration, we are uniquely placed to help the world save itself. Let's make our future selves and those who come after us proud of what we've achieved. It's now my great pleasure to introduce the Chair of Net Zero Australia, Professor Robin Batterham, AO, the Keno uh, Professor of Engineering at the University of Melbourne, to share further details of this historic initiative. Thank you very much. Thanks, Professor Terry, and thank you very much uh, for giving us the venue here for the evening uh, so that we could have a formal opening. This has been quite a journey. There's so much happening about the transition and what have we got to do to make it happen. There's people who concentrate on hydrogen. Hydrogen is the answer. Hydrogen is the future. I even know somebody who drives a hydrogen car. Uh, there's people who concentrate on electrification. It's all about electrification. Well, let me tell you, all of these things are worthwhile, but they're only part of the story. What we're hearing tonight is the result of a great team effort. And this team has looked at the whole of Australia, all parts of the energy and emissions scene, not just electricity. And we've included exports and how you can get rid of the emissions associated with uh, exports. This is a monumental task, make no mistake. The uh, effort that's gone into it is in fact well beyond anything that's been done in this country before. It mirrors what was done in the USA by the Net Zero America team uh, out of Princeton University. And I wouldn't say that we've shamelessly stolen what they've done, far from it. We've actually collaborated with them and they've, um, they and their collaborators have been a core part of this project in terms of the methodology. But it's applying it to Australia is what we've done here. So I'm not going to talk about the results, but I want you to bear in mind that what we're doing here is the totality of the system. So you might have your preferred view of how things should go. And I'm not going to paraphrase uh, any of them or make fun of them. Um, they're probably all important, albeit we haven't used what I would call silver bullets. 
we haven't used technologies that are still emerging because the task is so great. It's got to be largely stuff that you can get off the shelf now and plug in in large numbers. And these numbers are large. So that's enough from me. I think we all want to see the results. I just give you one health warning and this is probably the sort of thing that you're not allowed to do these days in terms of total equality of everyone. Um, there are roughly 20 times as many males who are slightly colour blind as there are females. I can't get into the transgender part and I won't either, uh, that'd just be silly. Uh, but what I'm pointing out is that there are a lot of colours on charts. Uh, don't worry if you can't make all of them out because it's going to all be on the web and it's all coded and you can pick up all of the details. That's enough uh, from me. This is a monumental study. It's been an awful lot of work. It covers an awful lot of ground and some of the answers people won't like, so be it. We've done things openly. It's all on the table now, or it will be by the end of this, if I stop speaking and hand over <laughs> to Kat, who's going to introduce the speakers. Thanks, Kat. Thank you very much, Robin. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor uh, Terry. It's really good to be with you here in Brisbane and online. I'm going to tell you, if I can find the little clicker, a little bit about the Net Zero study. Oh, and I'll also set you out the, the uh, framework of what we're going to be talking about today. You can see there that we've got the presentation about the study, the modelling, what it'll take to achieve uh, Net Zero, and then what Australia must do and must decide. So, here we go. About the Net Zero Australia study, thank you for the lead in, Robin and uh, Professor Terry. I'm going to tell you about this study and what makes it unique in a very crowded landscape. I'll also tell you about the people who were involved and the modelling approach that we've taken. I'll do that fairly quickly, but it'll set the context for the results that uh, Michael and Simon will run us through and then the mobilisation framework that Richard uh, will take us through at the end. So, what is the Net Zero Australia project? It's a whole of economy study looking at multiple pathways for Australia to get to net zero, both within domestic and export emissions. It highlights the choices to be made and their consequences so that we can have a thoughtful debate about how, how we get to net zero, which goes beyond the headline. I'd like to highlight a few key features, although I think my thunder has been stolen a little, um, about what, what uh, makes it different. The granularity. You will see our results shown at a level of downscaling, both from a time perspective and geographical perspective, which actually creates profound uh, consequences. And you'll see some pretty interesting maps shortly. The study is also building on what um, Robin said, it's technology neutral. We use technology which is available or plausible now because we simply don't have the time to wait for cold fusion, although if it comes, it'll be very welcome. The other feature, which we're very proud of, is that the study is completely transparent with our methodologies, our assumptions, our sensitivities all being publicly available on the website. You may disagree with our approach, you may disagree with our inputs, but at least then we can have a constructive debate about the why and the what, and this will add to the energy literacy of the discussion around net zero. The study leverages the methodology used by Princeton for the Net Zero America study, which was used in developing the thinking for the Build Back Better initiative, which then became the Inflation Reduction Act. And we've, uh, we're very fortunate to have been able to collaborate with Princeton on this. The project is a, um, a collaboration between University of Melbourne, University of Queensland, thank you, um, and uh, Princeton, as well as the NAUS group, and I must say that uh, NAUS has helped lift the, the results to another level. Thank you very much. The study was funded by the sponsors listed there on the left in alphabetical order. Uh, we have uh, APA, we have Dow, we have two CRCs being Fenex and Future Fuels, we have Mindaroo and we have Worley. And although Worley is last alphabetically, they were certainly not the, the last in, in coming to, to us and supporting the project, so thank you. 
The terms of the sponsorship ensure the, the, the project's independence, and we thank our sponsors for indulging us with this because I must say that the independence is actually a hallmark of this study, and we've been very protective of it. We've been engaging very broadly across a broad range of diverse advisors, and they're listed up there. Um, they've been very generous with their time and provided strong feedback. We have listened to them, we've explored their, their, um, the information and the interactions, and we formed our own views. The results that you'll see today and the study do not represent any of their positions or views. Beyond the advisory group, we've also been engaging or very widely across governments, both at a federal and state level. We've been talking to industry groups, NGOs, research institutions, everyone. We've taken real pains and real effort to be accessible and to ensure that we're taking a whole of economy, whole of nation approach. Here we have the Net Zero Australia team, or actually I'm gonna call it a bit of a community. On the left hand side, you will see the, the steering committee, um, most of whom are with us today, apart from Dr. Chris Gregg, who is in, in Princeton, and where, uh, which I'm proud to sit as an independent member along with Robin Batterham, of course. We, we bring together deep and wide expertise and have overseen the project. The buck stops with us. We also have researchers and advisors from our participating institutions shown here. They have worked across geography and difficult time zones to deliver the results within a tight time frame. And I'd like to give a particular shout, shout out to them for all of their fantastic efforts in getting us here today. It was a really big lift over the last couple of weeks, so thank you. Today we're presenting our final results, having provided a first look in August last year. In July there will be a mobilisation report and Richard will talk to us a little bit more about what that will cover. I would categorise today as the what and the so what of uh, Net Zero, with the mobilisation being the how. Mm -hmm. So that's the background to the project. What have we modelled? What's been our approach? We've taken a modelling approach which has a linear reduction in emissions across both domestic and export emissions, it's using 2020 as a baseline. We've taken the best available input and tested them across several scenarios to find the least cost optimisation. We then downscaled the results to model those pathways across time and geography to give a sense of the scale and speed at a very granular level. In designing the scenarios, we flexed the key parameters that reflect the boundaries of the Australian debate, namely the rate of electrification, renewable build rates, the limits on fossil fuels and carbon storage. This slide shows a schematic of, the, of how we've modelled the linear reductions. For domestic emissions on the left-hand side there, the starting point is 600 million tonnes of CO2 per year starting in 2020, which is our baseline year. For exports, it's roughly twice that at 1.2 billion, uh, billion tonnes. We took 2050 as the target for domestic emissions, but for export we've taken 2060, which reflects the target of some of our major trading partners, namely China, but also India. We've run a few sensitivities to accelerate the target in both instances by 10 years. There are six core scenarios that we've modelled and um, I'll step you through them because they will give more context to the plots and graphs that you will be seeing shortly. On the left hand side, we have the reference scenario. Um, this is the baseline scenario to be able to flex the other um, scenarios with policy settings that have been frozen from 2020. Not an overly sophisticated scenario, but it reflects business as usual. It is based on historically low prices for fossil fuel costs, and it doesn't include any new uh, constraints on greenhouse gas emissions since 2020. We then have the two demand scenarios on the left-hand side, rapid electrification and slower electrification. In the rapid electrification scenario, there is nearly full electrification of transport and buildings, as well as residential and commercial by 2050. There's, a cap on, uh, uh, there's no cap on renewable rollouts, pardon me, and there, but there is a cap on CCS at 150 million tonnes. The slower electrification uh, scenario slows down the transport and buildings because they, they're going to be harder to retrofit and adapt. However, all the other inputs are the same. 
On the right hand side, you'll see the supply side. There are three scenarios that we've, we've uh, tested. We've used the E plus or the, the rapid electrification uh, demand scenario in developing these because the screening level results that we had showed that these would be the least cost. And don't forget we're using a least cost optimization approach. So we have four renewables rollout. What does that mean? No fossil fuels by 2050 and no limit on the renewable rollout. Go for it, gangbusters. There is a lower cap on CCUS, which is only used for non-fossil fuel uses, for example, for industry such as cement, for aviation, for biofuels, and of course for direct air capture. The carbon has to go somewhere. The cap in that instance is 150 million tonnes a year. In the next scenario, constrained renewables, we've limited the rollout rate. Now, it's still at a healthy five to 10 rates of historical averages, but it's not as fast as the RE plus scenario. Now the constraint could be anything. It could be supply chain, it could be labour, it could be permitting, the whole range of factors which we don't have a crystal ball to see, but it precludes a fast rollout. In this scenario, we've adopted a much higher cap for CCS to be able to reach net zero, and the cap is in the order of 1.2 billion tonnes per annum. The last scenario we're rather proud of, actually, because it was uh, new to the Net Zero America. We had to actually f uh, take a view on what Australia is going to be like as an export nation. Uh, this scenario tests the local production of iron al and aluminium as well as clean energy, rather than exporting the, the energy and the raw commodities to our trading partners. Are you still with me? There's a lot to get through. So what does this study do? The study models the pathways to net zero to show the scale, the speed, the cost and the complexity of trying to get to net zero by 2050 at a whole of economy approach. It shows the implications of key choices and it shows the impacts across the society, economy and the environment, with biodiversity becoming a more critical issue as we go. What this study doesn't do is it doesn't make predictions. It doesn't consider fossil fuel supply constraints, some of which we're seeing now. It doesn't analyse the costs of climate inaction because we're, we're taking the approach that actually we're trying to get to net zero by 2050. And it doesn't model demand for our clean energy, energy exports because that's actually not something that we can determine. It's actually up to our trading partners about what they want and it also depends on the global um, playing field and uh, the competitors that we face. With that, I'll now hand over to Professor Michael Breer, who will run us through what it will take us to get to net zero. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kath, and good evening, everybody. Lovely to be here in Brisbane. So what would it take to reach net zero? Well, now let me... There we go. I'm an expert. <clears throat> well, we can summarise this with three points. One, deliver an energy transformation that is unprecedented in scale and pace. Two, transform our exports as an essential contribution to global decarbonisation. And three, invest in our people and our land to reduce impacts and share benefits. That's all pretty easy to say, isn't it? But as you can see, each involves several immense efforts that we will now discuss. One warning though, and to Kath's point, we are about to start drinking from a fire hydrant that we have made as small as we could. And we'll do our best to answer questions later this evening if we move too quickly. Point one, deliver an energy transformation that is unprecedented in scale and pace. Here we show, yeah, getting ahead of myself. Here we show what is called the domestic primary energy in our core scenarios and by year. Primary energy is the energy that we ultimately use, but in its naturally occurring form prior to use. None of these energies are electricity yet, but a lot of this energy, and indeed most of it in some cases, becomes electricity before we use it. You can see that each of these net zero scenarios features the dramatic growth of wind and solar energy. Whilst we stop using coal and reduce and or stop using natural gas and crude oil products. Some cases, like the RE plus scenario in the middle there, 
we have no fossil fuel use beyond 2050, for example. If we have any fossil fuel use beyond 2050 for the domestic system, because we've enforced net zero by 2050 in this case, its emissions are either captured directly and sequestered geologically, or offset by drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere and then sequestered geologically. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a net zero domestic energy system in 2050. And hence, you can start to see how geological sequestration plays an essential and complementary role to renewables in achieving net zero in this study, but more on that later. We now turn to the primary energy of our exports. You will immediately see that we have moved from a six-ish exajoule challenge to one that is significantly larger. And once again, renewables do the heavy lifting in all but one of the net zero scenarios whilst we can discontinue coal and gas exports. In the renewable rich net zero cases, the large increase in primary energy to 2060 as we decarbonise slightly more slowly our exports in response to our international partners' targets. The large increase in primary energy to 2060 is because we convert renewable electricity to green hydrogen, then to ammonia for putting on a ship, then reconvert it back to hydrogen at the point of use. Each of these conversions also involves some energy loss and thus displacing an equivalent amount of fossil energy at the point of use with a clean equivalent requires more renewables in the first place. And this would also be true if we replaced ammonia as our hydrogen carrier for export with liquid hydrogen or some other hydrogen carrier. Some may perform better and some may perform worse in this regard. I don't think we yet know. So, is one exajoule a big number, let alone 30 plus exajoules? Well, one exajoule, 10 to the 18 joules, is a little more than all of the electricity that we currently consume in Australia per annum. So that's pretty big. But what do this more than 30 exajoules in these net zero scenarios look like mid-century? Well, here is a map of Australia today with its less than one exajoule of electricity generation, mostly from fossil fuels. We can see some dots here and there. That's solar and wind, plus some fine lines that are our existing national transmission network. That's what one exajoule electricity system looks like, about what we have today. And here is what Australia would look like in one of our net zero scenarios in 2060, with its more than 30 exajoules of primary energy production. In this case, we have immense renewable assets across the north where it is most sunny and pretty windy, mainly serving exports. But we also have a much larger national electricity transmission network moving electricity around the nation. And if you look closely, loads of renewables in the hinterlands of our capital cities supplying those domestic loads people like us right here, right now. Plus offshore wind, gigawatts of it. So that's one indicator of the physical scale of the Next Zero Challenge. So that is what 30 plus exajoules of primary energy and 1,800 million tonnes of avoided greenhouse gas emissions looks like. But wait, there's more. Energy storage. In addition to this immense build of renewable generation and transmission, we also project an immense amount of energy storage. Even in our do nothing scenario, the reference case. That's technology costs just working its way in even without a greenhouse uh, objective. But the net zero scenarios are projecting about five times the power capacity of Snowy 2 we haven't constrained demand for, for PHES, pumped hydro, like Snow E2, and our modelling says we need five times Snow E2 in power output, plus a lot more batteries again. This is batteries in our homes and businesses, in our streets, and at utility scale. 
batteries, batteries everywhere. All providing different services as part of the national fleet that is intended to support renewables and provide reliability. But wait, there's even more. We project that new gas-fired generation supports much more renewable generation and, and more energy storage, but it is used more and more sparingly, more than 10 times less in some scenarios. So gas use, and therefore its greenhouse gas emissions fall a lot, with other sectors offsetting these increasingly small emissions as part of a net zero objective. And we must not forget about energy efficiency and electrification, so-called energy productivity. Dramatically improved energy productivity is also projected to play a major role. Depending on the scenario, our, our projections show that similar final energy demand, uh, sorry, excuse me, depending on the scenario, our projections show similar final energy demand over the transition to what we have today. Whilst our population and GDP are projected, projected to grow by roughly 50%. That is a lot of avoided new generation, renewable, storage and fossil, and new energy networks. Almost 50% of investment avoided, you would, you would estimate. So, if we break down that energy use by type, Unsurprisingly, we see a lot of electrification, but we also see the uptake of zero emission fuels where we project that it is appropriate to do so. But we don't electrify everything, and we project that fossil fuels continue to have some role by mid-century. I particularly point out the purple bar across the bottom of the slide. That's aviation fuel, which I use today, and we'll and which many of us use coming to and from this wonderful country. Many of us, and certainly myself at the start of this project, didn't appreciate how much aviation fuel we use. We also don't project an alternative to aviation kerosene. So net zero must either offset it or replace it with a zero emission alternative. We find both being used in this study. And hence we come to the provider of the net in net zero. Car carbon capture, utilisation and storage is projected to be needed for non-energy uses and to achieve negative emissions, offset the offsetting sectors that are hard to abate, like aviation, like agriculture, chemicals, cement, steel and others in our analysis. As such, even our scenario that only permits renewable new build, that's the E plus, RE plus scenario in green at the bottom, uses the best part of 100 million tonnes per annum of CCUS in the transition to net zero. So renewables and CCS are not found to be either or, but rather both required in our projections. Putting this all together, we now come back to our maps and the transmission of several different energy commodities. Here again is the Australian Electricity Network in 2020 as a context. And as we progress through the decades, we see it expanding nationally as we put in more and more renewables. 2030, 2040, 2050, 2060, even energy transmission between Queensland and Victoria. That's collaboration. But we needn't build all this transmission. We can constrain this interstate and transcontinental transmission if we decide to, and achieve very similar outcomes in terms of total costs by building more network and other non-network assets such as storage within our states and regions. So as we have said previously, the future is what we choose it to be. And we could imagine some state governments finding this sort of result interesting, as might people who care a lot about their land, but more on that later. And this transmission task isn't just electricity. 
we project the build of hydrogen transmission across the nation in some of our net zero scenarios. Those big purple lines going from inland to the ports is hydrogen made from renewables going to ports for export. But there's transmission of hydrogen elsewhere. And not just hydrogen. CO2 transmission from point sources to different reservoirs for geological sequestration, even in these fully renewable scenarios that we're looking at. And the transmission of desalinated water to these immense electrolyzer farms inland for green hydrogen production, so that the green hydrogen can then be transmitted to ports and cities for use. Now, of course, all of these immense investments are going to cost a lot. Here we show the total capital investment, which is not a direct indicator of our energy bills, but related, but not a direct indicator, for both the domestic and export energy systems across our scenarios. And whilst seven to nine trillion, with a T, is an immense sum, we must remember that most of this money should come from our international customers via export contracts, and the world is a big place. Australians should not be paying for all of this. Indeed, maybe this is an immense opportunity for others to invest in our nation. Nonetheless, a feature of dominantly renewable systems is that they are mostly capital costs and have low operating costs. That presents challenges to their financing that we'll be talking about a lot more later on uh, uh, tonight and later in the year. But what might these costs look like if we smooth out these immense capital investments over the lifetimes of those investments? To do this, we calculate the so-called levelised costs. And now we see that the T in trillions has been replaced by B in hundreds of billions, few. It might surprise you that we spend more than 100 billion per annum already on energy domestically. And that is pre the war in Ukraine, by the way. But Australians buy about 1.2 million new cars per annum. We all buy a car on average about once every 15 years, new car. But 1.2 million new cars per annum, and each of those costs $50,000 you have a lazy 60 billion there already. That includes everything, not just generation, transmission, distribution, but all the appliances that we use to consume this energy and provide ourselves with energy services. So you can start to see how we spend these immense sums. And whilst we spend more domestically on achieving net zero compared to doing nothing, we project that these costs as a fraction of GDP remain similar to today. Nonetheless, Relative to doing nothing, we are projecting cost of abatement for both our domestic and export systems rising to more than $100 a tonne. Although interestingly, our onshoring scenario avoids a lot of these costs to international customers. Simon will talk more about this interesting result in a moment. And so finally, we come to nuclear. In short, relative to the cheapest nuclear power station that has been built to date, we project that nuclear generation would need to be about 30% cheaper and renewable rollout would need to be constrained in order for nuclear to play a role, to win on an economic basis in a low carbon world. And then that role is projected to be modest. This is not a statement for, for or against a particular technology, rather it is a projection of what it would take for nuclear to be economic in Australia. Manufacturers, installers, operators and regulators will decide whether it will be, as they will for everything. I now hand over to Simon from the University of Queensland to discuss the rest of our modelling and talk to you more later on. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael, uh, for that really comprehensive overview of the energy transformation that, as we say, is uh, unprecedented in pace and scale. 
So let's uh, now turn to our exports. How might we transform them? And how might they be, or could they be, an essential contribution to global decarbonisation if our trading partners require clean energy and our exports are internationally competitive, which we believe that they are likely to be in a decarbonising world? So on this side, let's look at the exports. Our modelling shows that Australia has the resources to build a clean energy export industry. That's what you see in the middle chart there, where the 15 exajoules of coal and LNG exports that Michael talked about are progressively shifted from fossil to a clean hydrogen carrier by 2060. Now, as Michael mentioned, we're modelling ammonia. It's a placeholder. It's currently prospective, but ultimately the global market will decide what the ideal form of clean energy or clean hydrogen carrier will be. It doesn't materially change our results uh, to, to shift hydrogen carriers. Green hydrogen from electrolysis is projected to be the largest source of these exports in four of the five scenarios. Blue hydrogen from reforming of natural gas with carbon capture and storage can contribute a material share if we are unable to keep up with the build rate for wind and solar. In this scenario, and only this scenario, we may also exhaust our total demonstrated resources by the mid-2050s without further exploration. The chart on the right shows how we are able to onshore the processing of minerals like iron ore and alumina into iron and aluminium. As we move, these, uh, as we move this processing onshore, providing zero emission products instead of zero emission energy, we see both the efficiency gains from avoiding the conversion into, of hydrogen to a carrier and back again at an export destination, and that the most prospective export zones, as we'll see, in a, in a, or as we've already seen from Michael, also coincide really well with our established iron ore export industry. Moving to this slide, we see, let's consider export costs. And we find that whilst the cost to export clean energy will rise, it should be competitive in a decarbonising economy. You can see from the chart on the right that levelised costs per unit of energy by 2050, 2060 are substantially higher than pre-COVID prices, but comparable to current crude oil and LNG spot prices. Two caveats. I'm comparing costs and prices, and I know I shouldn't, but I think we all understand the implications of them being in the same ballpark. Second, the scenarios that we've, we've modelled were set before those prices began to materialise in the real world, and so our reference case can be considered optimistic or very optimistic, depending on your own world views. Now, four of the five scenarios show similar trajectories. There's not a lot to differentiate them, although the uh, renewables constrained case, does, which meets the energy exports with blue hydrogen, does appear to come in marginally more cost effective across the transition. But the standout is the onshoring scenario, which comes in at approximately half the cost of the other scenarios. And that ties in well with the slide that Michael previously showed us, where the cost of abatement associated with onshoring this minerals processing is substantially lower than the export of clean energy. The implication for importing countries is that they could save significant expense by importing Australian refined commodities while achieving costs of emission abatement that are comparable to Australia and the US, even if they are major energy importers. It also suggests that Australia may well be in a strong position to pivot to clean non-energy commodity exports if other countries end up producing more of their own energy domestically. Let's get back to some maps for context. So for context, this is our 2060 map uh, for the E-plus uh, scenario. Pursuing high electrification, the model chooses uh, the lowest cost mix of supply without constraints. So let's compare that situation in 2060 to the one where renewable build rates have been constrained. So this is the renewable constraint case. And gas with CCS has enabled Australia to continue to export clean energy at the same amount that it does today. Of note, the renewable energy infrastructure is still significant, fulfills roughly half the export demand, the rest from blue hydrogen. 
but the transmission infrastructure required is substantially strengthened with multiple large transmission lines and even an additional one going from east to west or west to east, depending on which way you want to look at it. Shifting electricity from onshore wind to export zones and other demand centres, primarily because we can't build other renewables fast enough. That's the scenario design. If we then compare that to the onshoring scenario, we see significantly less solar PV infrastructure. It's about one and a half terawatts as opposed to 2.7 terawatts. And the Northern Territory and Queensland export zones are the ones that are most affected. Those iron processing facilities that I talked about previously are located in the Pilbara in Northern Western Australia due to the proximity of the iron ore industry, the three ports that are there, and the high quality renewable resources nearby. That leads to a small increase in solar capacity in those regions. Also by 2060, we see that this scenario requires only half the transmission infrastructure that the E plus scenario does. That's still about five times the current transmission uh, infrastructure. Then we ask the question, what about regional costs? What if the costs of building in remote regions across that northern sun belt are increased due to remoteness and the fact that uh, very few people live there? We have to build it all from scratch. So this is a sensitivity where we kept the costs in the southeast states, South Australia, Victoria, Tasmania, New South Wales, the same. But we increased the cost of construction in Western Australia and the Northern Territory by 30% and we increase the cost of construction in Queensland by 15%. And you can see the dramatic shift that happens. Now we're not suggesting that covering most of central Queensland in solar panels is a likely result. In fact, it's very unlikely that such a development would proceed without further regional cost adjustments. But what we do want to highlight is that the cost surface across Australia is pretty flat and small changes enable other states to play a significant role in the export picture, meaning that the future can be what we, or indeed what each state, choose it to be through policy settings that attract investment or keep costs down. And then we turn to the third point. What it would take, uh, sorry, to invest in our people and our land to reduce impacts and share benefits. Our workforce. Our skilled workforce in the energy sector grows from about 100,000 today to seven to 850,000 by 2060 across all the scenarios. That has significant implications for communities, for First Nations people, for national security and for immigration. Now that sounds like a very really tremendous growth and it is, but for comparison, there are around 600,000 jobs in the healthcare sector right now. And that's projected to grow to about 2 million by 2060. So even with this transformation, the energy sector will be one of, but not the major employer by 2060. Most of the new workers, around two thirds, will be needed across the regional and remote Australia. That ex those export zones across the Northern Sun Belt, hosting all of the infrastructure and the associated ports. They would experience significant population growth with the caveats from the previous uh, chart that says those regions may move to more populous, those export zones may move to more populous regions depending on how those regional cost adjustments play out. Two thirds of the workers require a trade skill or, or TAFE training. One third roughly requires a higher degree. Interestingly, of the top 10 professions, and you can imagine that electrical trades are at the forefront um, they only represent about one third of the total jobs. So that's a very diverse set of people and skills required for the transition. The land sector. So Michael talked about the importance of CCS, or CCUS in, in our modeling. The other lever that we have to pull uh, in terms of sequestering carbon is the, the land sector. And we see the importance of moving that sector towards net zero, potentially net negative, by reducing livestock emissions, expanding afforestation of farmland uh, across the nation. But despite these and other initiatives like fertilizer inhibitors, using waste methanes, and avoiding land clearing on, on, in the land sector, we see that it doesn't reach net zero in our core scenarios. 
our land plus sensitivity, which was our most positive assessment of additional improvements, like better management and, and restoration of rangelands, we see moderate net negative emissions. And in a future that is built on renewables, like the RE plus scenario, that is enough to offset the need for CCS, but only in that case. The implication is clear though, we cannot rely on the land sector to provide significant offset opportunities to capture and permanently store carbon as we head towards our net zero targets. And then our final key insight, that we must manage, carefully manage, major land use changes as they have the potential to impact both positively and negatively the Indigenous estate, our ecosystems, agriculture and our communities. That was made abundantly clear to us when we began this mapping and downscaling exercise back in July last year. Um, so what process did we adopt and how did it stack up? Well, we actually developed our own methodology because we didn't see that any other methodology out there was sufficiently nuanced to consider all these issues appropriately. At the end of our work, we still probably don't believe that any, exists, uh, any process exists that's sufficiently nuanced. But because this is a really complex space. Um, but we believe that our approach offers new and unique insights. So how do we produce those maps that you see? Well, we establish the project, uh, prospective project areas based on their cost and energy outputs. Then we apply exclusion layers. So those are the layers that are in the colors that are shown up there on the slide. That removes uh, areas, this, this relates to areas where infrastructure should not be sited. It removes areas protected by law, reserves, defence, shipping and air traffic lanes. And then we remove those areas supported by evidence and stakeholder interaction, um, things like irrigated crop and grazing land, rain-fed cropland for solar, the likely habitats for critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable species. And we've been consulting widely and updating it each time as more information comes to hand. We then overlay our maps against some of those uh, stakeholder groups. So on this slide, we look at the intersection between the Net Zero Australia infrastructure and the Indigenous estate. We see that 43% of projects, that's 43% of the infrastructure needed to deliver Net Zero for Australia, is cited on the Indigenous estate as it's classified here. So these are projects where early engagement with respect to the protection of cultural heritage, as well as benefit sharing for communities, local energy security and employment opportunities should follow free, prior and informed consent, including a right to veto throughout the project life cycle. Looking then to the biodiversity and conservation space, we overlap our, uh, our net zero infrastructure against some uh, nascent key biodiversity areas that are being developed. They're shown in green there. The overlap is pretty hard to see with the colours on the slide, particularly at the range for the audience here in, in person, um, but it's still there and it's still, uh, it's particularly prevalent in the, uh, in the southeast. And then lastly, the overlay with agriculture and land tenure. We've got on this slide a lot of colours uh, showing irrigated and rain fed lands, um, different land covers and different landholder agreements. Um, and I guess I'll, if we think back to that remote cost sensitivity that we, we ran before, we can show that um, that particular sensitivity shifts the siting of infrastructure from what is largely crown land to leased lands. And that increases the complexity of negotiations likely over land use into the future. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to Richard to talk to us about what Australia must do and what we must decide. Thank you, Simon. I am the last segment of the fire hose, but I'll give you fewer facts and more questions. Um, and the question starts with a statement of what Australia must do that you've already seen. That is the, if you like, the, um, the boundary between the modelling of net zero scenarios to the question of how can we make it happen, as Kath said before, from the what to the how. 
This is a recap of um, what you've already seen Michael and Simon speak to, that the summary of what Australia must do is deliver an unprecedented energy transformation, transform our exports, which are not only a major earner for the country, but they're also a major source of economic security for our trading partners, and to invest in our people and land, and Simon gave some insights into what that might mean in particular for affected Indigenous communities. We have some big decisions to make as part of deciding what we must do and how we must go about this. They are monumental and controversial to varying degrees. And we will tackle them between now and July, the we here being the Net Zero Australia team. We'll tackle them between now and July when our mobilisation report is due as Kath outlined in the timeline. We're not attempting to provide answers that are simply our opinions based on our philosophical preferences. Values, of course, enter any analysis like this, but we will tie our answers to evidence, mostly from that superb modelling that you've just seen presented to you, uh, but also from other research which is relevant. And we'll also engage as widely as the time allows to get answers and indeed to get questions that make sure that our thinking is comprehensive. So what I'm going to give you here is not any more facts. You've been given a wonderful presentation. Uh, it's more a sample of the questions that we will tackle to give you a flavour of this last phase of this particular, uh, well, in fact, the last stage of this phase of the project. And certainly if we've missed anything, if there's something you think we would very much benefit from hearing, we'd like to hear from you, and our website is a good vehicle for that. So I will start with, there are three slides to follow about, uh, which raise some headline questions on what Australia must decide. The first of those, um, in, way, in some senses, perhaps the one I should have finished with, but I'll start with it, is what are the roles of governments, of businesses and households in achieving net zero? You've seen an enormous capital requirement in order to mobilise this transition, seven to nine trillion dollars. I don't say that because it can't be done, but it is sizable. It's difficult to imagine that it's going to be uh, that it will, sorry, it will require a large commitment of capital from the private sector, that is, on those numbers, unavoidable and necessary. And so business has a huge role to play to invest in the transition, both as supplies of energy, as farmers, as users of energy in industry and in general business. Householders, of course, are increasingly both users and producers. And you saw energy productivity statistics um, that, in, that sit, and sitting behind those is a major shift in how we use energy in our vehicles, in our houses. So household, householders are both and can do much more and indeed will be called upon under our analysis to do much more. Net zero is bringing governments into play, far more than in the energy sector which went through a period of reform in the 1990s where the role of government was substantially downsized. Governments are now coming back into the frame and doing more. And the question then is, do they need to do more again? Or do they need to do less? And if so, where do they have to do more and where should they do less? Should they just act differently? And perhaps the overarching question is, this is an enormous collaborative effort to pick up Professor Terry's comment at the outset. Um, some have compared it to a wartime effort. That might be an excessively dramatic comparison, but it is certainly um, a challenge that we have yet to tackle, or they've never been tackled on this scale in my lifetime. And that raises the question not only about what are the individual roles and how should they be played by these different actors, but then how should they work together as well. And you'll see that question on the screen um, about balancing the coordination that's required to capture the scale economies of the transition and minimise supply and price shocks with competition, which has been a driving force of economic policy for the last 30 years. We will need competition, almost certainly, because innovation and, and efficiency come from that. 
but we'll need this coordination and we need to make that a happy marriage. If I go to the second point there, what role in global decarbonisation do we want to play is another decision that we need to make. We have, as you've seen, abundant clean resources. And we are a relatively small economy with an enormous resource endowment, which suits us well to the task of meeting our own needs and having a large surplus available to sell to the rest of the world. Exports would, of course, offset the loss of revenue and jobs from um, the cessation, the gradual phasing out of coal and, and LNG sales. So we have a self-interest just to replace those and maintain the employment, possibly increase it, that they now provide. We also have another self-interest. Decarbonisation is a global phenomenon. So anything we export that assists a trading partner to reduce their emissions comes back home as an advantage to us. It limits climate change worldwide, so of necessity, it limits it here. But you've also seen from the maps that particularly I think Simon went through that the impacts of green exports are great, even with onshoring, even if we decide that this is the obvious time to add more value to our own mineral endowment through our renewable energy resources. Even in that situation, we see a large degree of change in our landscapes. And that means that the balancing act of working out what role we play in global decarbonisation versus uh, maintaining our ability to absorb change here is going to be a challenge that we need answers to. I'd also point out that those graphs that you saw about exports show a very long period of decline of fossil fuels. We will be exporting for a long time fossil fuels on those projections. And that of course, could aid decarbonisation amongst our trading partners whose economies will need to stay buoyant and well supplied with energy so they can invest in their own transitions. But equally, we might be afraid that in doing so, we're maintaining a dependency on fossil fuels and delaying their commitment to decarbonise. And I think we have 30 or 40 years ahead of us of significant controversy about that particular question, just as in the 70s and 80s we had over the export of uranium, and whether in doing so we were aiding or indeed uh, aiding and abetting or, or reducing the risk of nuclear proliferation. If I go to my second slide of questions, Professor Terry raised the issue of options at the outset. Which, and, and the question here is which essential net zero options should we prioritise and accelerate is another really important question for the mobilisation stream. As you can see from those graphs, we may end with a very narrow set of energy sources and uses. And indeed, in the conjunction that Simon mentioned of full renewables and a very good uh, return, a net negative emissions outcome from the land sector, uh, we may end up with renewables and absolutely nothing else, not even carbon capture and storage by 2060. But all of those graphs are not the future, as Cass said. We're not predicting, and we can't predict. It's all much less clear than that. The crystal ball is foggy. So keeping a wider suite of options alive in the face of all that uncertainty has an obvious rationale. So the question then becomes, how wide should those options be? How many should remain on the table? For how long? And indeed, because of all that uncertainty, how do you mobilise investment from a private sector facing such uncertainty? Huge numbers of projects occurring in parallel, interacting with each other commercially, um, are going to require different rep responses and different approaches to get that investment unlocked. And there's a series of questions there which elaborate on that. But I can point even just to the question about networks that you see on the fourth, uh, the fourth one down. How do we de develop networks to move these various commodities around when, in some cases, the source of energy that they might, or of whatever commodity it is that they're actually transmitting, may not yet exist. The demand for it may not yet exist. Uh, and yet you're asking for an investment to be made in the expectation that that source and that demand will materialise later on. And equally, the source and the demand will be asking themselves, can I possibly invest if I know, if I don't know, that I can actually obtain or indeed move the commodity I'm making? It's a chicken and egg problem. It will recur repeatedly throughout this transition. It requires a response. The fourth question there is how should we distribute investment and jobs across the nation? Now, again, you've seen from the, from the maps 
that investment in jobs, and I would add to that closures and job losses, will be unevenly distributed across the country. Uh, the underlying costs and emissions of different options will largely decide what goes where. But to Simon's point, the, it doesn't take much to perturb those costs to get a very different distribution of those investments across the country. So at the margins, and possibly even more fundamentally, government policy and funding and corporate choices can influence where things go. To what extent should that happen? And so you see that applies in the questions there to exports, uh, should they come from the north or across the states, uh, and other questions that we will tackle. But I won't go through them all uh, because I just want to stay at the, uh, at the level of the concept. And finally, two more questions. How should we mitigate the impact of large land and sea use changes? The, the maps are quite arresting in showing just how extensive that will be. It doesn't mean we can't deal with it, it uh, we can't accommodate it, but it does mean we have to work out how. The many advantages of renewables come with that one challenge. I mean, renewables offer so much. They offer so much energy security, they offer so much sustainability, so much hope of a continued uh, economic prosperity not dependent on, increase, on, on further discoveries of, uh, of uh, resources, of finite resources, but they do have very high impact on landscapes and even seascapes. And that comes with social and environmental risks that are significant. And on top of that, to my earlier point, we need to mobilise many of these investments in parallel, many of these construction programs and projects in parallel. So managing impacts project by project could slow us down when speed is of the essence. And yet we do not want to trash the landscape. To the contrary, we want to come out ahead. This should be a gain for both the climate and for biodiversity. How do we do that? Should we do more planning to make that possible? Should we do, take different approaches to the achievement of net gain in biodiversity. And finally, how should the, the cost and benefits of decarbonisation be distributed is a really important question that we will tackle. It's pretty evident when you think through what you've just seen that some places and people will be affected more than most. Indigenous communities in export zones, low-income households across the country, fossil fuel workers in areas of decline, Farmers in renewable zones who stand to gain but also stand to uh, have large impacts on their farming practices and indeed will have to decarbonise their own operations as well as in some cases accommodating new renewable industries in their midst. The impacts will be greatest in rural and regional Australia and that will potentially set up a tension which is already emerging in some renewable energy zones of a sense that why do we have to do this for the city. There are answers to that. It can be done, it can be, uh, those, those problems can be mitigated, approaches can be taken. The question is what are they and, and uh, how ambitious will they need to be is the questions that we'll be tackling here. It's important to say this is, or to observe, this is the first industrial revolution, I would argue, driven by policy. And it will raise expectations that governments will help those who do stand to lose and so we end up with a net gain outcome socially and environmentally as well as in, in the terms of the climate. That is the kind of, the, the, those are the questions and probably some more that uh, you will have and that, that we have missed out that we will be answering over the next, or attempting to give answers to. They won't be complete answers, they won't be the final answer, but they will at least, uh, um, in our hope, they will at least take the debate forward and offer some strategic guidance to governments, to business and to households and to individuals as to what they can do to mobilise this extraordinary net zero transition. And with that, I will hand back to Kath. Thanks very much, Richard. I'm clearly the shortest of the group. Uh, so that was a fantastic presentation, very broad, very deep, and I'm sure you've got lots of questions. Richard's asked us a lot, but now it's actually your turn over the next 40 minutes or so to actually um, to probe the results and ask the questions that are no doubt forefront of your mind. May I ask the, invite the panel to come and uh, join us there?
By way of a process check, because we have about 200 people in the room and I think over a thousand online, we're going to uh, ad uh, approach the questions by way of uh, microphones, roving microphones in the room. Please wait until you have the microphone in hand because this uh, event is being streamed. For the people who are joining us online, if you could please type in your, your questions, I'm sure you already have, and my collaborator over there, Dr. Dominic uh, Davis from the University of Melbourne will collate them. And what we will do is rather than relying on technology, which um, I have a patchy experience with, what we'll do is I'll, I'll be curating the, um, the questions and throwing to Dom and to, so that we can cover as many as we can. Hopefully that makes, uh, makes sense. We'll uh, see how we go. Right. So. While you're thinking of your questions, if you're in, in the room, if you've got a question, please put up your hand and we'll get a microphone to you there. And, but in the meantime, I might just um, throw start the uh, proceedings over with um, actually asking a question to Simon. And it relates to the new technologies. So you would have seen that there are lots of wildcard technologies, lots of technologies being developed to generate clean energy, to deal with emissions. Why haven't we allow, allowed for the new technologies in this study? And surely that's an oversight. Over to you, Simon. That's a, sorry, that's a, that's a great question, Kath. And I think we've kind of alluded to it a little bit uh, across the presentation already. Um, but what we've seen tonight is that the task is monumental in scale. Um, and you know, this is a delivering an energy transformation uh, that is uh, you know, unprecedented in scale and pace. We don't have the time or the luxury to wait around for a perfect solution or the perfect solution. We need to take action now with the technologies and knowledge that we ha already have available to us. Um, now, if, you know, and I think you yourself alluded to, to cold fusion. Um, so if, if something, if, if a magic silver bullet comes along uh, in the next couple of years and we're you know, rolling out uh, fusion reactors left, right and center, then fantastic, that's wonderful, that makes the job easier. Um, but our, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, I, I don't really like the idea of uh, planning by hope. I'd much rather have contingencies in place uh, and deal with uh, real technologies that are, uh, you know, proven and, and demonstrated. And that's the approach that we've taken uh, through our methodology and what you see in our results as well. Terrific, thank you very much for that, Simon. And I guess what we're seeing, you know, we used to see climate denial in the past. It's now switching perhaps at times to climate deferral, so actually not act taking the action that we need. And being able to work with the technology that currently exists or is plausible actually means that we don't have that excuse anymore. The scale and pace and complexity really needs us to get after it. I wonder, just uh, before we go on to the, the question in the room there, uh, Robin, perhaps you could speak to the, the learning curves in technologies that we've applied. Yeah, thanks, Kath. Um, it isn't that we have ignored uh, how things are developing. The learning curves, how prices come down and how technologies get better, is built in to all of this work. Uh, and it's not stuff that we've pulled out of the air. It uh, goes right back to the uh, CSIRO work, which also underpins the uh, AEMO uh, ISP work. So technology learning curves are built into this. Thank you very much, Robin. Now, can we have the uh, question in the room? Please, could you... Oh. I'm sorry, who has the microphone? It's hard to see. <laughs> it's fine. As we've seen, reality is a little bit messy. Our modelling is actually perfect synchronicity. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Kerry Burke from Shell Energy. Uh, Look, really interesting results, really like all the mapping. In the reference case, um, where do the gas fields and gas pipelines go to sustain current exports to 2060? Sorry, with the, with the reference case in particular? Yeah, so in the reference case, you've got gas exports continuing at the current level until 2060. Yep. Where does the gas come from and how does it get to port? So the reference case is effectively Australia in 2020 in zombie mode projected out into the future. So the expectation with that particular reference scenario is that um, gas fields, and this was also you know, uh, conceived as a scenario before things like 
the safeguard mechanism were, were proposed and, and other mechanisms brought in um, before we had any net zero policy, in fact. Um, and so the expectation would be that you know, we, we continue uh, operating uh, as we were in 2020 and that if, if gas fields uh, decline, that that would be replaced through standard exploration as is you know, happening already. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Richard, you'd quickly like to add that we were just we weren't modelling weather to do this. We were modelling how it would happen, yeah. and so we didn't put a lot of attention mm -hmm. to unpacking the reference case and saying, "Oh, you know, if, if we did this, what would happen?" Uh, that that would be a question of whether you would embark on net zero at all, and we were assuming that. It sets the baseline against which to compare it. So, we might just move to an online question, Dominic, perhaps. Thanks, Catherine. Um, we're having some questions come through uh, about the modelling of electricity systems that are dominated by variable renewables. Um, have the study, has the study taken that into account, the variability? And what about system security issues like a black system restart? Thanks very much, Dom. I might hand that to you, Michael. Uh, yes, we have. <laughs> uh, in fact, um, fellow next to Dom, Andrew, uh, extracted all of those time traces for wind and solar resource over every square kilometre of the 7.7 .7 million square kilometres that we have on this continent uh, as you, and used that in the optimisations that project that uptake now uh, uh, that we see these, these terawatts of renewables. Um, in terms of system security, that's a very, very important question and it's a question that we can't answer formally using the methodologies that we've used in this study. The reason for that is that there's no computer big enough on the planet to do a proper security assessment of any of this stuff. So um, there are many different ways to analyse system security. You would have to do it over a smaller geographical extent or a smaller temporal duration than anything we could do here. But uh, I'm no specialist, I'm a mechanical engineer, not a power system engineer, but it would seem to me that uh, enhancing system security and ensuring system security is not going to have a really large impact on total system costs. In fact, it's complicated, it's, it's very tricky, but it's not as capital intense as the seven to nine trillion we're talking about here. It's much, much less than that. Great, thank you very much. Uh, next question in the room. I think there was one at the very back, please. Oh. Sorry, who's got the microphone? There we go. Hi, it's Genevieve Maloney from BP. Um, some really huge developments that will be needed across the country to deliver net zero. I'm interested to understand in your modelling whether you've considered, considered the life cycle carbon impacts of those developments and how that may have changed some of the outcomes that um, you've put forward in the findings. Um, so the, the, the short answer is that the, we've considered the operational impacts of, of all of the infrastructure, but we haven't actually considered the life cycle emissions of the infrastructure itself. They are a, typically a very small component of um, what actual operating assets are. Um, you know, in our model, the, the, the materials, the technology magically appears on our shores and gets distributed where it needs to go. Um, because it's a model. Um, this is an area of, uh, that we'd really like to explore further, actually, both in terms of understanding mm -hmm. supply chains, we can link in uh, you mm -hmm. know, life cycle assessments as well, depending on where those materials and technologies are produced. Um, but fundamentally, we don't think that it would affect um, the pace or scale required. It's not gonna materially change our results, uh, but we didn't, we didn't formally mm -hmm. uh, consider it. I think I'd probably like to add that with the phasing in of such a high renewable build and rewiring the nation, it's going to occur at the same time where we're phasing out existing brownfield infrastructure and projects. This will create real tensions in the system, which we haven't really modelled yet, but we do need to start thinking about what happens in the decommissioning space. What is it that we do with the brownfield sites? How can we access them to use uh, the strategic infrastructure, perhaps uh, help from a biodiversity perspective if they're brownfields? So it's an area to, to work on. Um, can I maybe uh, throw another question to you, Dom? Sure. Uh, we've got some questions about 
how, how is this going to be financed um, with a particular point on gas power capacity? Um, so the global need for capital is enormous. Will there be enough uh, for Australia? And, and how can it be appealing for an energy sector to build more gas capacity that's not going to be used very much? <laughs> Thank you. I might have a go at that. Sure, Richard, and then I might uh, tag team on that. <laughs> cool. The bravest. <laughs> so, uh, I, I think what you're seeing in a transition that has multiple investments happening in anticipation mm -hmm. of demand and driven by policy, uh, but not always fully commercially financeable without mm -hmm. assistance from government, you're seeing a lot more intervention now. Um, and indeed, in the electricity market, there would be a reasonable case to say that governments have been present in some way or another in, in a lot of the capacity that has been invested in even since um, the liberalisation of the, of the system occurred. But when it comes to... Um, so the model is certainly selecting commercially, you know, on, in, uh, as the model would compute it, commercially viable um, technologies to invest in, but we are also aware that, that markets are not necessarily going to respond exactly as the model would suggest and will explore through the mobilisation stream the extent to which there was a case yeah. for some kind of underwriting or concessional financing or um, uh, the creation of demand or other forms of assistance that may be needed to unlock that capital investment. So it's a watch this space answer, mm. I guess. And I might just um, build on that actually because We've all heard about the trillions of dollars that are sitting there ready to invest. After COP26, I think there was some extraordinary number being put out by the Global Finance Alliance. That actually is for FID-ready projects, final investment decision projects. So effectively, they have been de-risked. What we're seeing, and, and uh, Dr Chris Gregg, who's in Princeton at the moment, has a particular focus on this, is actually that pre-development phase is really at the risk of de developers and is the most risky. As you go through an investment, you stay, go through stage gates, you de-risk it, you get the approvals you need and the permitting. But until you get that final investment decision, it's at large. So we don't have a funnel of projects sufficient to, fill, to, to meet what we've described in our, our modelling at the moment. So, and there's a, there's a question around your historical economics and how do you actually make it work how do you support those projects? And then we look at the, um, the gas capacity. If, I think the, the number was something around 10%. We'll be building more peaking plants, but they'll be used for much less than we have now. What, how do you actually finance that? These are all good questions to be um, considered, and it may need to take a new approach, whether it be long-term offtake contracts, incentives, whatever else it may be. Uh, we have a question in the room, and uh, while we're getting a microphone to that uh, person there, I might just flick to the next slide which is actually the key findings, which might be a prompt for those both online and in the room to, to uh, <laughs> remind you of some of the questions that you might have had on the way through. Your question, please. Hi, my name's Tim Myers from PDC Machines. Um, just kind of touching on the last two questions and going a bit further, in the how, is there any talk of how we get this kind of discussion into a transactional or, or contractual space, as in, how do we value defossilization or you know, fossil intensity? Because that's essentially how we get the investment, how we get the whole industry driver. Is that part of the hows that you're thinking of at the moment? I'll, I'll let Richard um, speak to that um, and then perhaps uh, to Robin. Well, Robin, why don't you start and I'll follow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, while they're figuring it out, let me just say that um, scope three emissions, <laughs> guys, <laughs> scope three emissions will need to be reported on um, in Australia from 2024. Um, I think fundamentally that will start to really um, drive some uncomfortable conversations and make clear what needs to be done from a financing perspective. Sorry, Richard. Uh, sorry, Robin, over to you. Mm -hmm. I, I think there are some bookends in this debate. One of the bookends is to say, well, what's the bluntest tool that you can imagine that's going to force things to happen? Let's have a carbon tax of $1,000 a tonne. Mm -hmm. There's an extraordinarily blunt tool. That would change uh, everything overnight. Uh, and that's all you have to do, just legislate it. 
Um, now, that's not going to happen, of course. Uh, the government would change at the next election if there wasn't a, a revolution anyway. Uh, but you can get my drift. There are blunt tools and there are more subtle tools. And the more subtle tools um, are things like, well, do you have uh, vehicle emission standards, for example? And I think at long last, this country uh, is starting to move in that direction. Right. And there's a host of things in between which can shift the incentives to invest. Um, I think perhaps right at the end, when we're finishing up, I'll say a little bit more uh, that there are some levels of this. So we have actually need to have the sort of debate which Richard was framing mm -hmm. as to what are the key things that we can consider that will expedite this. Just a couple of things to add to that. There, there could well be at least some decarbonisation action that happens without any explicit price being put on carbon or any regulation being imposed simply because stuff gets cheaper. Uh, that is at least plausible. Or people decide of their own values and companies as well as buyers that they just want to go that way and they're going to spend their capital without being told to, to buy an electric vehicle, put a solar panel on the roof, do whatever else it might ultimately to an extent cost them but they still want to do it. I don't think that's going to take us necessarily that far. Um, do you need a whole of economy carbon price? I was involved in, in helping design schemes like that in the 2000s. Uh, as we know, the history of them was not particularly salutary for the country. But even where they exist, they are all uh, countries that tend to have them also tend to have more specific regulatory and subsidy measures that, that have sectoral impacts or, or more forensic impacts. Um, vehicle emission standards, Robin's example is a case in point. Um, to say, for example, that we will not allow uh, internal combustion engines to be used past 2035, it's a popular idea in other jurisdictions, is a form of carbon price. It just is a form of carbon price on a particular use, on a particular source of carbon, not on all sources. So uh, there's a, a case for intervention not always being needed, uh, and there is certainly a case for different scales and scopes of intervention and, and uh, they are carbon prices by another name, however forensic uh, or however broad. Mm. And I think the, the risk is we're talking about systemic change here. And if we have a whole lot of EVs, that's fantastic. But we actually need the infrastructure to be able to support them as well. And that's where perhaps some of the bottlenecks will come up and that's some of the risks that we're seeing. Another one from online, please. Thanks. Um, there are some questions about the needs of these energy assets that we're building, and particularly uh, the raw materials, the copper and the rare earths and, and other things. Where, where are they coming from to build these new energy assets? And the people to build these assets, where are they coming from? And what about the services that they will need? Um, should we be teaching renewable energy in schools? Oh, I'm going to throw questions. that over to uh, Michael in a minute, but can I just say I think something that we really do need to build on in, in this country is actually energy literacy. To be able to understand that electrons in the grid are not coloured green or black, they're just electrons. Michael, over to you. Th thanks, Kath. So um, where's this stuff coming from, the raw materials? Well, some of it will come from Australia and at the moment go offshore, be made into stuff and then come back and go elsewhere. We haven't quantified those full supply chains yet. That's something we're very interested in doing. Mm -hmm. So what, maybe watch this space. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a second question, but I'll go to the third one around teaching in schools. Yes, mm -hmm. oh, the people, I'll come back to that. Teaching in schools, of course, teaching renewables. Um, maths and physics and chemistry would be, a, more <laughs> of that would be a good start as well. Right? Um, and I can fearlessly say to the Vice Chancellor of the University of Queensland, we need more engineering academics and more engineering uh, students at the University of Queensland. And you, and you can recommend to the Vice Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, fearlessly and independently, Absolutely. that we Absolutely. need the same at Melbourne. Yep. So, so we need to be teaching a lot more people in TAFEs and in universities about how all this stuff is built and how it operates. Can I just um, add to that though, Michael, and um, I'm not an engineer, I come from a commercial legal background, I would also say that in this transition, taking a systemic approach, you actually need strategy, you need commercial, you need business development skills, you need project management skills, you need a whole... And community engagement. And community engagement, because this is not an, a very large task that we have, and it will bring in a whole range of skills that are beyond just the technical. 
if you look across the spectrum of you know, technical, economic, commercial, operating, political, the whole spectrum of skills needs to be applied here. So it certainly, is... Certainly. But so, the most popular job is electrician. So, so yeah. um, no, that's exactly right, Kath, of course it is. As I've been mentioned, the top 10 most popular jobs are 30% of all the jobs. It's very diverse. Um, but going back to the total number of workers, mm -hmm. that gets to this point. We have to be teaching a lot more people how to do this stuff, mm -hmm. and we might be needing to bring a lot more people into the country who know how to do this stuff as well. But those numbers are big, going from 100,000 to seven or 800,000. Yes, that's big. But we currently employ two million people in healthcare right now. We currently employ more than a million people in construction. We currently employ almost a million people in manufacturing and in other sectors such as professional services and other things. Um, we may have even employed 700,000 or so public servants additional in the last 20 years or so, I think, in this country. So those kinds of growths in workforce are not without precedent and uh, uh, therefore, we can be quite optimistic that they're achievable. I would just add to that, as sort of we do a bit of a dog and pony show, I guess, because if you're looking at the remote areas where we have, um, you know, the workers that we're talking about, then it's not a FIFO model. That's not going to be a sustainable model going forward. So it's, we may be talking about however many hundreds of thousands of people, but they come with families, they come with all the services to support them and the utilities that are there, so it's bigger than that. We might have a, a question in the room. I think I saw a hand there, Micro uh, microphones there, please. Um, yeah, Greg Buskey. Hey, Michael, good to see you again. Uh, it's, uh, look, I mean, I haven't seen a presentation that's just that comprehensive in terms of thinking about all of the dimensions that are going to be part of this transition. And just to pick up on the point that was made, uh, with that population, not only growth in the skills, but the shift about where it sits, mm. did you look at um, the impacts on the sort of infrastructure you're actually going to have to be building for that population shift and how material is that as it shifts from, say, one geography to the next in the planning? We haven't yet. That's a very good question, Greg. Um, the, whole, the whole further granular analysis of communities across the nation is, is a really, really big piece of work. We first have to have some idea what needs to be build, built where before you can do that kind of analysis. Mm and uh, supply chains and community um, investment at a granular level are two obvious things we need to do more work on. Mm. And I think part of it is that the flat optimisation space you saw from the, the change in costs in the remote regions, it actually has a really big shift across the nation. How can you plan for that unless you have some guardrails set up earlier? So, um, Dom, is, do we have anything else on the online? Cool. And we'll have another one in the room after Yes, pl plenty of questions still online. <laughs> um, question, a number of questions on CCS. Yeah. Um, are there global case studies of carbon capture and storage that works and is cost effective? Um, there have been many cases that don't work and there also may be secondary impacts of injecting CO2 underground. Thanks. Michael, would you like to take that one, or Simon? Oh, I can, I can, I can talk to that one. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there are, there are, um, there are demonstrating projects. There, there's one in Australia, right, that's operating right now in in, in Gorgon, um, where CO2 is being captured, it is being sequestered. Um, there are uh, other uh, demonstration projects and, and commercial projects that have been happening around the world. Um, not as many as is needed and the development um, has been, uh, I guess, stymied is certainly, in, well, maybe stymied is the wrong word. It, it hasn't developed as fast, uh, anywhere near as fast as what the renewables, uh, you know, cost reductions we've seen. Um, but there's certainly existing projects. It, it has been demonstrated. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd mm. I think that, I'd, I'd... There's no questioning, I mean, having run a resources area in government for quite some time, there's no questioning that this is not an easy thing to do, mm. but it is doable. I think there are quite mature projects in other parts of the world that demonstrate that. You can't do it everywhere in every geology. It is selective to particular places, and you saw mm. that from the maps. Um, <clears throat> but I think that the, I would just point as a former policy advisor to the fact 
uh, that uh, renewables justifiably have been given tremendous assistance from the policy sphere and it has helped catalyse an industry which would not have developed to the rate it has without that. It's a good thing. Um, we would have had such a driver for carbon capture and storage had a carbon price been legislated in the country. It didn't happen, got defeated. Um, I think we would, we would have seen a different investment appetite and probably more, um, at least more interest in it. Um, but I think it's also fair to say that, that CCS thinking started in many cases, and if I can simplify too much and my panellists, my co-panellists might, uh, might disagree, but it started very much with the thinking that I oh, will take existing power stations, we'll capture the CO2, we'll put it underground. Mm. That turned out not to be the bonanza that it might have been. It doesn't mean it can't be done. It certainly hasn't been as prospective uh, uh, or as, uh, as viable <clears throat> as the kind of uses you're now seeing being modelled and thought about, which is in particular to turn fossil fuels into hydrogen and its derivatives and to capture carbon dioxide using renewable energy from the atmosphere to put it on the ground and create negative emissions. Those are, I think, I would say, are the two principal uses we've modelled. Yeah. And that is a very different prospect than the one that has perhaps held CCS back. So there's no questioning it's a big challenge, but it has certainly been done. Mm -hmm. And where it's commercial, it's largely been done just to recover oil from near exhausted reservoirs. Mm -hmm. And it works in that context quite well, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. But my yeah, yeah. colleagues will disagree if they wish. Thanks, Richard. I must say that um, CCUS is a really polarising issue. Fundamentally, for us to get carbon out of the atmosphere, we need to put it somewhere. It's um, either in uh, geological storage or in biological storage, and we've seen from the, um, the land use graphs that it's actually going to be really hard unless we get after it. Um, I guess the other, other piece is that um, we're talking about net zero to 2050. We're not even talking about the carbon overhang of all of the carbon that actually already exists out there, and we'll need to do something with that carbon. So over the next 10 years, most of the pathways that we see, whether they be you know, fast or slow, constrained or otherwise, they're relatively similar, and I think what we can actually all agree on is that we need as many options as we, as we can in our toolkit to be able to do something to get to net zero. Um, is there a, there's a, a question in the room, microphone there please. Um, uh, this one first and then that one back there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this is Hans Hermes from Worley in Germany. Uh, I find this a very interesting and very comprehensive um, uh, study um, and also agree that this is a very huge task, uh, an unprecedented change in the whole energy system that needs to be done. <clears throat> but we are in 2023 now, and we're looking towards 2050, so this is 27 years from now. Mm -hmm. And working in this industry, we can say that we see every month new developments, disruptive technology, uh, inventions, etc., mm -hmm. which will change the whole view, and, uh, mm -hmm. or can change the whole view, and the interdependency between uh, the different elements that need to be developed. Yep. on the demand side, yep. uh, on the materials, etc. So have you considered if that shall be a guidebook for political decisions and investment decisions, etc., to have a regular update of this? Because otherwise this is a snapshot from today that could be overwritten easily in six months. Perhaps I'll have a go at answering that. Um, Working as the chief scientist of this country for several years, one was often asked to work, on, work out what the priorities should be for how this country invests its R&D, or at least the government side of the R&D, and what incentives one should put uh, up for industry. And at the science level, uh, you can go some way towards that. At the technology level, it is so much harder. So I don't want to avoid your question by saying that's a very good question and we'll <laughs> avoid it, uh, but that is actually one of the legitimate answers. The thing about technologies coming through is that they're not pushed through. It's as much pull as it is the availability of them uh, and a bit of push from those that are developing them. Mm -hmm. So we've chosen in, uh, and so this is, your position is absolutely legitimate and I have to say, uh, as somebody who's uh, always optimistic, I really hope, I think cold fusion is a fair way off, <laughs> but there are many other things that are coming through that are going to make these maps horribly wrong. Mm. 
because these maps have been on the basis of saying we're not going to rely on things that aren't commercial or very near commercial yet. So your point is absolutely valid and uh, like you, I would hope that some of these things will come through and make our life a little bit easier to get on with the task. But this does paint the picture that even without that, you've got something which if you set your mind to it and really decide you want to do it, you can make it happen. So let's have the new technologies as well. I well, don't argue in the slightest. Well, can I just yes. um, add to that though, before I hand to you, Richard, I think the, the a path between coming up with a concept or a pilot and commercialising it at scale and the speed that we need is actually quite fraught. I think in uh, uh, translation terms, it's called the valley of death, that the great ideas just don't actually get it out through the other end to be commercialised and be economic. So that, that's something else to keep in mind. Richard, you had oh, another question? It's a, it's a great question, and it isn't only just the new technologies that may come forward, which will. There's no question that, that we don't have the perfect crystal ball. But even the mature, the more mature technologies that are being modelled here, uh, and for which cost curves are projected, and you'll see that all in the assumptions that are going online uh, now as we speak, um, even those will undoubtedly be wrong to some extent, mm. right? And so in five years' time, the world will look different. We'll have experience. Um, there would be a case for certainly for the country to reassess what the future looks like and to adjust its course accordingly because the foresight we have now will um, be proven to some degree or other not to be accurate even with regard to what we already know we can deploy. So I think there is a case for the country to do this kind of work on a more regular cycle. Mm. Whether this project does, that's a question that, that will be debated within the project. Which is actually a good question about, you know, what is next for uh, Net Zero Australia? You know, is there a phase two? But maybe we'll just park that for the moment. I think there's, there was a question at the back there. <coughs> and then I'll move to, to another online one. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Guy Lane from Vita Sapien. Just a quick question as to whether you've taken into consideration the uh, prospective impacts of climate change in the future decades uh, with these analyses. Um, because by some of my reading, uh, I'm unsure as to whether Northern Australia is even going to be habitable by humans under mm. situations like wet bulb 35 and etc. Mm. Michael, I think that's one for uh, you. Yeah, we, we, that's a good question. And, and also, uh, well, not just hotter, but also perhaps stronger storms and so on and so forth. Um, a little bit like the security question, if you're going to do the kind of modelling where we've got increasing frequency of storms and heavy precipitation and then more intense droughts and so on and so forth. That kind of long-term planning is, is computationally extremely demanding. In, in our modelling, we've assumed uh, and, uh, uh, the, the most um, pessimistic projections of what temperature rise will be in terms of uh, its impact on uh, energy consumption and particularly the need for heating and cooling um, across the nation. Um, in terms of uh, uh, agricultural impacts and the ability to grow more stuff in the north or not, if it gets very dry, uh, that kind of analysis was done um, prior to the energy system optimisation, where we were making estimates of what we think you know, could happen in this, in, in this um, hi higher uh, emission future. But it's a very important question and it goes back to the limitations of our modelling, and it also goes back to the, the, perhaps the need to revisit this stuff uh, more frequently to get those better assessments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, a question from online, please, Dominic. Uh, the maps generated a lot of interest online. Um, mm. We showed that a lot of the, uh, the big solar arrays are in the north of the country. H how was that location chosen? Um, and then specifically, was there a decision not to produce green iron in South Australia, or was that a model finding? Um, so in terms of the, uh, how the, the solar, well, how all of the infrastructure was sited, um, as I mentioned, the, you know, we, we did a really um, detailed analysis of the, the entire uh, surface of Australia, identifying prospective project candidate areas. Um, and then uh, and, and ranking them based on both you know the 
the cost associated with building the infrastructure and the prospective energy output from it, so effectively the capacity factor of any asset cited there. Um, that builds up um, a very large array of potential projects, and then we overlay those exclusion areas, those, those purple uh, and, and other coloured areas that we saw on those slides that I talked to, um, in order to, um, I guess, avoid, in, in order to ensure that infrastructure is not sited in those particular regions. And then we just take the most prospective areas first. What is the least cost optimal way of supplying the energy um, that the model says is demanded? Um, in terms of reference to the question of, you know, an iron industry in South Australia, it's an excellent question. Um, the, there's a, an infinite number of uh, sensitivities and, and, and options that we could have run. With the onshoring scenario, we focused on the, the proximity of the, the majority of the iron ore industry um, to, you know, in the Pilbara to its three main export ports, as well as the fact that there was um, the most, or at least the second most prospective uh, area for solar, um, you know, the, those Western Australian hubs are the ones that appear slightly after the, the Northern Territory one. So that, that's a, a real, uh, I guess, you know, uh, it, it, it's just a, a meeting of the ideal locations for, you know, the proximity to the, to, the, to the resource, to the renewable energy required, and to the way in which to get it out. But we could, of course, um, and, and maybe should later, um, <laughs> uh, identify whether we could move the iron ore around. Um, no, 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 no. I think what this refers to is there is, um, there. There is a lot yeah. of iron ore in South Australia. Correct. Um, it's, you know, iron knob iron, and so forth. Uh, and if you look at the solar insulation rates, they're not awful bad in uh, South Australia. They're a bit better than in Victoria. Uh, and without getting too partisan here. So, but on the economic optimization, given the resources and the sunlight and the ports and the size, the Pilbara beat South Australia. But it, you don't have to change the capital costs much to see pretty healthy yeah. development in South Australia. Mm. And we saw that on the, on the sensitivity of regional cost uh, differences that there was a quite large uh, export uh, hydrogen industry developed in South Australia. Uh, I speak with a conflict of interest in a sense, I'm a South Australian born and I worked at the Wilder Steelworks, so, you know, declare oh, I worked there too, that once. background. But uh, there it is. It, uh, I think if you can join that regional cost sensitivity mm. with the availability of iron ore in the region, it's a pretty plausible uh, scenario in a sense to say that if it works somewhere else, it could also work there. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> And it comes back to Michael's point about the future is what we make it. So those decisions will actually e impact on where the iron ore industry, uh, the iron industry will be. Are there any more questions in the room? There's one in the front here, please. Uh, oh, there's one back there, and then over to here, this one next. Thank you. Yeah, um, Jean-Louis Salinas from Siemens Energy. Uh, I would like to know if the model consider some um, the international competition in your export of green energy. Obviously, you have great numbers and great ambition, oh. um, but to have an export market, you have to have off-taker and you have to make a product available at a competitive, um, mm -hmm. at a competitive case. And there are some regions in the world which are gearing up now and investing in large-scale projects. And um, how do you see that? So far in Australia, we are lagging in, uh, you say, in products which are ready to FID stage. Mm -hmm. And do you, does your model take into account the international competition for, the, for the, this green energy as a, as a trade? And mm -hmm. uh, do you have any recommendation from the panel about what Australia need to do in the coming years, uh, not 10 years, but two, three years, in order to uh, gearing up to achieve those numbers? So I might take the first part of that, which is around, you know, what did the model consider in terms of uh, international trade or, you know, international competitiveness? So we didn't actually model the, the demand for our energy exports. To do that, we would have had to have done a global model um, to look at where energy is needed, needs to flow around the world. We, we took, we, we had a couple of options, actually. 
we took as relatively simple engineers, Michael and myself, I'm Kem, he's Mac, um, basically took the option of projecting uh, a flat uh, export demand. So whatever it is that we're doing now, we uh, project that out into the future. We also ran two sensitivities, one where we doubled the export demand because there is potentially a future where not just the trading partners that we've spoken about here, but potentially other regions or other, other trading partners in, in Southeast Asia might require more of our exports. Mm -hmm. So we ran that sensitivity. And we also ran, uh, I guess, another sensitivity where, we, where our exports were less required by the world. Um, and all, all of those details weren't presented here, but they're available in our, in our modeling results online. Um, and so that's what our model did. Mm -hmm. um, there was a second part to the question that... Well, it's engaging with, engaging with our trading partners, and perhaps I could speak to that. Oh, no. Robin, would you like to speak to that? No? The, if you look at two industries in Australia, <coughs> which are very major parts of our exports uh, in the 100 billion uh, a year type uh, level, one is the iron ore, largely out of the Pilbara, and uh, the other is LNG. And you look at the capital costs of building those industries, they're monumental. They're the sort of numbers that we've been talking about tonight. So you look at them and say, how did they happen? They didn't happen because at a meeting like this, it was decided it would be a good thing to build an iron ore industry. They happened because there was a market demand and much of the capital came, and they didn't happen overnight, I might add, both of those. And the capital to build them, a lot of it came from the countries that had the demand. And personally, this is just a personal opinion because we haven't modelled it, I would see the same thing happening on this decarbonisation journey, that there will be those that want the product and, they, and whether it's actually uh, hydrogen, as in some carrier form or other, or whether it's uh, iron ore or uh, bauxite to alumina to aluminium or whatever, uh, they will want it and they will be prepared to co-invest, largely taking the lion's share, to make it happen. So just think iron ore, think LNG, and what's the next one? And I would suggest to you it's low emission products whether they be in the form of energy or processed materials. And I guess just to round that uh, answer out, it's a question of what is it that our trading partners actually want? Because at the moment they take our energy and our raw, raw materials and they produce on the, in their industrial complex wherever they are. If we're now talking about onshoring, there's a, a twofold implication. Firstly, we have to build that industrial complex here better for the carbon footprint, mind you, but then it also has knock-on impacts to those other countries and, and um, their workers as well and industries there. So this is a something that need, would take work and it's a very good question to be asking. Um, we're almost at time. We've probably got one more question. Um, is, do you have one from the... Yep. Dom? Yep. Yeah. Uh, questions about... Um global temperature limit that the modelling considered um, and an emissions budget, mm. uh, how, how was that considered? And then, and then some broader questions about whether the panel thinks that this net zero transition is, is possible, um, which is a big question. So there are a few other um, <laughs> more, more specific questions about uh, mm. how would you strategize and what do you see as being crucial for the next five to 10 years? I can take the easy one on the carbon budget and then hand, hand the rest off to others. Um, so in terms of um, Kath outlined, we took a linear reduction, uh, a linear reduction in emissions approach. It's a very straightforward, easy uh, approach to model. It's different to a carbon budget. Um, if we look at what the carbon budget is for each for our core scenarios, it's about 40 gigatons of carbon that's emitted across um, out to 2060. Um, now that's around about 6% of uh, the global one and a half degree carbon budget. Um, it's also supplying 20 exajoules roughly of energy into the domestic economy and into 15 exajoules into the export. That's around about 6% of the um, global energy demand. So it's about 6% you know, of the budget for 6% of the energy. 
The scenario where we run the, the faster, where we go to 2040 instead of 2050, um, that's a smaller carbon budget. It's about, uh, it's about uh, three quarters the size, about 30 gigatons. Um, uh, still delivering the same amount of energy as well. So it's not, um, it's not strictly along the lines of a carbon budget. Um, we could play with the way in which we you know, uh, are more aggressive at the beginning or more aggressive at the end. Um, you know, in terms of the modeling, the linear is a nice, um, a nice consistent approach across that. And the outcome is still, um, from our modeling, you know, effectively a one-to-one -one decarbonized, or, you know, carbon budget to clean energy provided. Um, mm -hmm. I might throw the other questions so around. Is, is net is zero it possible? Is it plausible? Well, we're using yeah, technology that exists and the modeling certainly shows that it can be done. It, however, needs a lot of things to actually line up to be able to do it from a systemic approach so that we're not stranding assets, for example, having the, the solar farm built but no transmission line. Um, there are decisions to be made and Richard will be able to tell us more about that with the mobilisation work that will come in in July. I guess this leads uh, very nicely on to uh, you know, um, the fact that we're almost at time and I have one question to Robin um, but I'd like to just, uh, before I hand over to Robin and ask my last question, thank you everybody for their questions, your participation and your enthusiasm. Really um, glad to, to have your energy here and also your perspectives. We've taken a note of all the questions and we'll be providing some um, responses on the, the website. My somewhat um, mischievous question is that at the end of uh, this kind of presentation, I feel somewhat uh, overwhelmed and disempowered and I've seen this a few times already. What can I do? Now, my answer to that question would be for us all to take a deep breath, have a drink and get on with it but I might hand over to Robin to uh, perhaps answer it in a more measured way and then to take us out. So, um, <coughs> I'll, I'll stand here. I won't try and uh, throw you off your podium there, Kath. Uh, Kath, thanks for handling uh, the questions. Thanks for the uh, team here also and for the uh, uh, online questions that have come in and the handling of them. And to you all for your attendance uh, here tonight. Please keep the questions uh, going. Uh, I would suggest to you, we've given you a lot of answers, but what we've shown is that this is not the only answer that's there. It does need a lot of discussion, and there are points that do need to be followed up uh, further. I was just posed an interesting question as to, okay, you know, what do you actually go out and do? This is doable. And it's doable because you can think of action at different levels. We could get very personal and say, uh, but don't worry, I'm not going to do this. Everyone uh, sort of stand up and those that can't think of something that they can do, sit down or leave and you know, we can <laughs> run through. And then one could be really cheeky and march up and say, you know, instead of uh, going off and having a drink, you tell the rest of the people here what you're going to do. Now, the drift I've been getting at here is that we can all do things. We can all choose what size vehicle we drive around in. By, by the way, I ride a bicycle. Uh, that's sort of pretty obvious from my build. Um, and whether it's electric or not, or hybrid. And I'm not going to enter any debates with my learned friend here who can give you the answer as to which way you should be heading there. Um, we can, next time you uh, remodel your kitchen, if you do such things or have renovations, make sure that everything is heading in the right direction of an emissions profile. And I'm not going to try and dictate uh, what that might be. Or when you buy appliances, what is their rating and so on. There's a whole bag of things that we can do personally. That's you and I, everyone in this room and everyone in this country or the world for that matter. Then there's things that can be done at district, at government, at various collections, including companies and investors which says, how can we go about things to make this happen? Because the size of it is such that it can be overwhelming and it can push us into almost paralysis and inactivity just by being overwhelmed. And an answer to that is to think alliance. And an alliance isn't the answer to everything, but it's just a mode of thinking that says, 
if we've got to have planning, if we've got to have finance, if we've got to have the ESG side pushing through the investors, et cetera, et cetera, how do we work on this as an alliance where most people at least are winning or compensated rather than as a competition? If I look at some of the press associated with the release of these results, most of it tends to be pretty supportive, cherry picking particular features of course, and some of it is, oh, you know, it's just biased in that direction or that direction. No, 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 we've got to consider all directions and consider how we pull it together. So my closing sentence is to thank you all uh, for coming, uh, for being part of the uh, journey. It's a journey that's of course nowhere near finished. It's just starting, it's the reality. And so let's get on with it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for all those in the room. I believe that there are drinks afterwards, so looking forward to the conversations to continue there. Thank you.